Hey, good morning. Good morning from California. Uh, it's good to uh, welcome everybody to Storage X Symposium again. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to uh, welcome two of our speakers today. Um, one is uh, Susan Yuta Yakuma from ProRogers. She is the Chief Sustainability Officers from ProRogers. And the second is uh, Lincoln, our own Lincoln Brevet um, Vance. Uh, Lincoln is in charge of our energy facility here at Stanford. Uh, let me welcome Susan to the stage uh, for the first uh, presentation. Let me do a quick introduction about Susan. Uh, Susan is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Pro Rogers. She is responsible for evaluating and scaling both existing and emerging energy solutions across the whole co uh, company's platform. This is a global company to ensure Pro Rogers continue to be the leader in, in the sustainability uh, in the real estate industry. Uh, before Pro Rogers, Susan was the president of Schneider Electric's sustainability business division. During her 16 year tenure uh, with uh, Schneider Electric, she was uh, instrumental in transforming Schneider Electric into a digital power and automation technology company driving sustainability. And before that, she served as the CEO of Schneider Canada. Uh, Susan recently was recognized as a 2021 Environmental Energy Leader 100 Honorary for successfully delivering climate mitigation action to enterprise customers. Uh, well, Susan has a lot of experience previously. Um, so I will not repeat. Um, Susan has an executive MBA from uh, uh, Northwestern, the, the Kellogg School of uh, Management. Um, in addition, she holds a Master of Accounting and Bachelor degrees from University of Waterloo. Uh, with this introduction, Susan, I would like to welcome you to share with us about your, your will and, uh, and storage and energy and general space related to ProRogers, please, Susan. Thank you very much, Yi, and thank you everyone um, for your time with me today. So I'm going to talk about storage from the perspective of an industrial um, logistics company and why it's so important to us and what our customers are asking. So, so for those of you that uh, may not be aware of who Prologis is and why storage is so important at this point for us and why renewable energy is so important for us at this point. I'm going to start with what's our thinking. So um, I am uh, super clear that we're at an inflection point. And, and what I mean by that is we all know that the, the consumption of, of energy worldwide is increasing. I looked at some stats the other day, and um, like if you look at the energy consumption today versus what it was in the 1900, it's 40 times more. And if you look at the energy consumption that we're going to have to have in 2050 versus it is today, it's 50% more. So the world needs more electricity uh, and energy. And at the same time, because of the focus on climate mitigation, as the world and governments and companies work towards a net zero by 2050 pathway, you know that you can get that energy from burning fossil fuels. So understanding this, we know that the world has to run on renewable. We're all, we're all clear that the grid, you know, the way, the way it's designed, it wasn't designed to have so much distributed energy. Um, in that that we together, whether it's businesses or academia, have to work with governments and utilities to solve for that problem. So we at Prologis are, are, are super cognizant of this. And then the other thing that we, we have in mind as we figure out how we want to operate is what's happening in the regulatory environment 
um, globally. For me, the Inflation Reduction Act is one of the most impactful legislation that has come into play. Um, it has, it's a signal, number one, that we are transitioning to renewable energy. It's important. And it's, 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 it's facilitating the, the, the adoption of energy by making it, um, making it economically feasible in so many more states than, than it has been in the past and really favoring alternate renewable technology when it comes to energy generation. Um, I'm in New York today and Local Law 97 is super important for us when we build because it's the focus on energy efficiency. And it says that if you exceed um, the allotment of, of energy that you can have for big buildings, you're going to pay a uh, for each metric ton of CO2, $268. So that adds up when you're building large buildings like, like we do. Um, the other thing that, that I'm super cognizant of is the SEC climate disclosure. Yes, there's a lot of debate on, on you know, when do we have to, to disclose and exactly what specifically related to scope three, so it's emission from your value chain. But we know that it's 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 going there. Then let me step back and look at Europe, where we also have facilities. Um, RE Power. It says that if you have buildings that are 250 square meters, um, you know, and if you're a commercial building, you must have solar power generation on the roof for all new buildings by 2026, and for existing buildings by 2027. That's really around the corner for us. And EU has been also very specific that, you know, all of the buildings in EU has to be net zero in by January 2030. Um, so you look at the legislation around the world and you can see they are moving towards a direction of renewable energy. They're moving towards the direction of, of um, decarbonization. And with the with the with the grid capacity where it is, storage becomes really important. Hence the discussion today. Now, before I go into what we're doing from a technology standpoint at Prologis, I want to introduce the the company itself because not all of you may be may be aware of the company or the scale. So Prologis is the world's largest logistics company, and it's present in nineteen countries. And, and to give you an idea of scale, in the 19 countries, 4% of the world's GDP in those countries go through our logistics center. So the value of those goods are $2.7 trillion. Um, we have 1.2 billion square feet of real estate worldwide. And why that scale matters is we we primarily, you know, we primarily impact the flow of goods everywhere. And if you are to decarbonize the world and if you are to decarbonize the, the supply chain, we have to take action and we have to take the leadership of that for sure. Um, and then in our facilities, we have 6,600 customers. And those customers are your Fortune 100, your Fortune 500, as well as medium and, and small companies who may not always have the resources in terms of what does it mean from a decarbonization standpoint, or what does it mean from an energy system deployment standpoint. Um, we have fit, almost 5,600 buildings around the world. And today we are the second largest uh, on-site energy generation in the US with 409 megawatts that is operating on our roofs. If you if you if you ask me where we were at the beginning of last year, we were at 295. So we are scaling up very fast, and that scale up is being driven um, for 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 a couple of reasons. One is we realize as the logistics company, we touch two really hard to decarbonize segments: buildings and transportation. If you look at what you see on the screen, 65% of the world's um, greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation or how we, the, the construction of buildings and the operation, the heating and cooling of those buildings. So knowing that we play in these segments, um, you know, we've decided that it's something that we, we need to address at, at Prologis. The other thing is a lot of our customers have their own net zero and sustainability goals. And they're saying to us, um, you know, it's great that you provide us high quality real estate, 
but how are you going to be a partner in our in our sustainability journey? How are you going to make sure that you give us facilities that meets our needs and our standards? So with all of this in mind, what we did last year is we um, assessed what our ambition is relative to net zero. And we were the first uh, real estate um, REIT to adopt a science-based target in 2018. So it's a natural progression for us to, to get to a net zero ambition. And our ambition is to be net zero on our scope one, two, and three. So the emissions from our own operations, as well as the emissions from our value chain. So the customer emissions in our facilities and the emissions that come from our supply chain as we build buildings by 2040. Um, so if you, if you think about 1.2 billion square feet of real estate, and if you think about the fact that we have to solve for embodied carbon and the energy consumption of our, our customers in our premises, it's a pretty, it's a pretty tough challenge. Um, and in order to make sure that we can deliver on our commitment that we have made, we have interim goals. And those interim goals are that we would be net zero in all our operations by 2030, so it's scope one and two, in that by 2025, we will deploy one gigawatt of on-site solar, and that we would be carbon neutral in our construction. Um, so we are pacing to these commitments, and I want to specifically come back to solving for the energy consumption of our customers. Um, if you look at our scope three, which makes up 99.9% .9 of our emissions in total, 67% of that is coming from on-site consumption of power by our customers. So um, our Solutions in terms of energy, in terms of storage, in terms of mobility is critical to us getting to our net zero ambition. So I want to talk a little bit about what does that mean? Um, so at Prologis, we have, um, I have actually two responsibilities. One is the chief sustainability officer that Yi spoke to earlier, but I also run the global energy storage and mobility businesses. And these are revenue generating activities that solve for the customer emissions. So um, let me walk you through what it is that we do. First of all, we have front of the meter solutions. So the, this is where the utilities are our customers with, the, with our locations, which are in industrial urban environment, you know, we're also present where there is grid congestion. So we solve for that by partnering with utilities and we provide them utility scale generation on our, on our roofs. Um, we provide utility scale energy storage, um, for, you know, in order to ensure that utility can, utilities can have good resiliency. And we, we, because of where we're located, sometimes we have the advantage of having substations near us and, and having interconnections that have capacity. So we, we really start from the standpoint of what is the capacity of power? And then we design our solutions to ensure that we can deploy, um, deploy our, our activities faster. Um, as you know, the grid, the, the, the interconnections and, and the grid access is a, it's, um, it, it's it's a uh, it, th there's delays. I mean, there's so many things that are happening, and utilities are 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 really um, striving to do what they what they can do, but the demand for for their services and the queue is just so long that as a company you have to be very strategic on how you go about solving that. Um, so when we when we um, when we provide our solutions front of the meter. We also think about our customer needs and we provide behind the meter solutions. And what that is, is we um, put in energy systems that, that address the, the, the self-consumption in our building. And we couple that with back of the meter storage so that we can deliver on savings to our customers by managing the load. Um, where resiliency is really important, you know, we also build data centers, for example, then we provide microgrid solutions depending on the ask of the customer. And as we design these, these offers, what we, what we thought about is, you know, if you think about a logistics center, a customer may move in, 
and then a customer will move out one day. And, and, and that is a deterrent to putting up energy systems because they don't want to worry about um, the, the, how long they will be there, what is the payback period, et cetera. So what we have said is we'll deploy the capital, we will install the system, we will maintain the system, we will ultimately manage the meter for our customers, and we will be a partner to the utility you know, based on their capacity needs. And when we do that, obviously we're leveraging the existing asset, the real estate asset that we have. And it only makes sense that if we're using that building to generate the energy, that we decarbonize that building itself. So we ensure to retire um, renewable energy credits against that building, so it is decarbonized. Um, I know I'm going uh, super fast, but I wanna cover a couple of other things. So as we look at our portfolio of storage. Um, we started last year, we really started mid-year last year in terms of thinking about um, should we do storage? Why is it relevant to our customers? What's the opportunity for us? And today, um, I would say not even a year into it, in our facilities in the US, we have a pipeline. And these are, these are, these are real opportunities that amount to 2.5 gigawatt of storage in the US and 2.5 gigawatt in Europe. Um, so we're working with the likes of Southern California Edison, PG&E, um, I- uh, Ilia in, in the Netherlands, um, so forth, in determining what is their need. So as we realize the opportunity for storage, um, we realize that we really need to work with the ecosystem to determine how to optimize the deployment of storage. Therefore, um, what we do is We work with Stanford. We will be part of StorageX very shortly. We work with um, the the, uh, CATLs and the BYDs. You know, these are the large um, battery manufacturers to determine how should we also move the technology from where we are today. But before I go into it, I wanted to share with you um, a real life example of what we're able to do when we deploy back at the meter storage in our facilities, as I mentioned earlier, there's no upfront cost to our customers to install or maintain. Um, you know, we we pretty much guarantee savings to them, so that we really um, we really motivate our customers in terms of thinking about energy management and greening of of the brown power that they may be using. And um, you can see that before we use back of the meter storage, the peak demand that you see on the on the screen was um, equal to 900. And once we deploy storage, it's reduced to 600. So it really makes sense for us to do it. And when we when we share these findings with our customers, um, it, it 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 allows them to see the benefit and the and the savings. And we are able to then move on our decarbonization journey. When we do solar deployment, we do exactly the same thing. So we deploy our own capital. We Um, We install and maintain and operate the system, and we make that green power available to our customers at the cost of grid power. So um, it it, it becomes really a a no decision on their part. And as we kind of thought about, about how we're scaling up, we realized that maybe it's easier for our customers if we manage the meter ourselves. So we are working on taking the meter in Prologis's name so that we then understand clearly, we have the data of the energy consumption, we can then size the system appropriately and we can then then optimize that energy. So this is the direction that we're going in, bringing real estate and and energy together. And maybe maybe, 10, 15 years ago, we would not have thought about it, but today, when we're having the conversations, whether it's with customers like the DHLs or FedExes or, or Amazon, power, access to power, management of power is actually um, forefront in, in their mind. Um, they know that fleet electrification is coming. And, and uh, we also provide charging as a service. So they are asking us to solve for those for those. Um, for those things that are happening in in our external environment. Um, I also wanted to to share a real life example of Solar Smart. We call our our, um, our solar solutions Solar Smart and a storage solutions Storage Smart. 
And he's a real life example in, in Redland, California with a customer that wanted to decarbonize their operation. And they said, you know what, design is the solution. So we provided them um, uh, on-site solar generation and storage for, uh, they needed five megawatt of energy. It took up 1.3 million square feet of, of, of that building. And we were able to offset 83% of the energy consumption of that building uh, in line with the customer expectation. And what I would say to you is maybe I will go to, to how we're thinking about, about, about our storage deployment. So I shared with you our um, pipeline. We are obviously today deploying battery technologies that we that that's commercially viable, lithium ion. However, we are starting to work with um, with with many people in the ecosystem on what are the new technologies that we need to to solve for from a battery standpoint. And and once we identify that solution, how can we help um, scale up scale up that 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 supply of it? Because sometimes um, you know, scale and scale is a is a is a challenge to new innovation that um, that's really available. The last thing that I would highlight to you is I mentioned to you that we do um, charging as a service. If you think about a logistics center, there are so many um, uh, heavy duty trucks that are coming into our facilities, and the easiest way for them to charge is when those trucks are loading and unloading. So the downtime is is minimized. And, and when you provide charging as a service or the charging infrastructure, storage is a, is a huge part of it because the grid, it could, it could be two years before you can connect, um, connect the infrastructure to the grid. So what we're starting to do is we're also providing temporary power in the, in the, um, by means of um, renewable gas and uh, coupled with storage. So, um, Jimmy, I think I'm going to stop there. I've shared quite a bit, and I think I'm I'm um, on I'm up up in my time. Susan, thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing this uh, really wonderful. I think uh, you, the the company plan and the the examples right here. Um, maybe I will ask uh, some questions first, Susan. Uh, sure. Before handing to Jimmy. Uh, it's fantastic to to see the example, particularly this last one, um, this charging this charging station right there. You actually install a storage right there. I, I really like the point you made. You know, connected to uh, the the grid uh, it might take two years. You have your local storage right there, so the storage will you be used to charging to charge this uh, charge up your truck. Um, for the application like like this, I I think the audience right here uh, cares about storage a lot. Uh, in terms of power, that loading, uh, the charge discharge uh, charge time, uh, how many hours are you looking into the charge? That's related to charging speed. Yeah. Yeah. So so right now we're looking at one hour batteries because they are the most commercially viable. But really, once we have the charging as a uh, as a service operating fully, we need long long duration batteries. So we need four plus hours. In some in some cases, we need eight hour. I mean, ideally, we need eight hour battery um, battery power, and and that's what we're solving for. Obviously, you know, working with with Stanford. As well as well as um, CATL and BYD, um, and we need to get there sooner than later. That's what I will say. Yeah. Okay, Susan. So Susan, so far uh, for the storage of your solar and also output this power, uh, what will be the? Um, I would say I shouldn't say pain points. You know, the the a uh, least of desired property of storage technology you are, you are looking into beyond the the current technology can provide. Yeah, I think if you look at the um, the energy consumption of our buildings today, um, I can solve for it. You know, when when you don't have fleet electrification, when you don't have automation, with like forty percent of the of the roof. Um, and so that's okay. 
But when I look at the future, when we electrify everything in the building, like the heating and the cooling, when we automate a lot of our logistics customers obviously need more and more robotics and automation, and you bring in the electrification of fleet, even if I put um, even if I put solar in every um, space that that we have on the roof, I cannot meet the the power demand of the building. So that's what I really worry about. So optimizing on storage is is super important for us, and and optimizing on on the on the ability to deploy those solutions sooner. Sometimes the wait time is 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 three to four years. That the trucks are coming now, you know that that's the problem. That that's what I lose sleep over. E. Oh yeah, yeah. So you show this number, right? So a uh, very <laughs> impressive number. You you have one point two billion square feet. That's right. Of, uh, uh, rooftop right there. Uh, would you uh, you would you have solar on? Uh, what's the percentage? Uh, thinking for the long term to get this yeah. one two billion to 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 become solar roof. Yeah. So if I put, if we put um, solar in every, uh, all our roofs, we can generate 10.5 gigawatts of energy. Um, today, I've got 410 megawatts that's operational. That that takes up only 4% of the, of the, of the square feet of, of roofs that we have. So we've got lots of, lots of more capacity to install. But at the same time, um, you, you know, when you put solar on the roof, you have to really care about the structure of the building. You, there's so many things that you worry about. So we're also looking at innovation like um, what are building in integrated PV? So not only do you can you use surfaces that are so it's lightweight solutions, but that also removes the need for some of the concrete, which which reduces the embodied carbon. So we're always looking for innovation to to see how do we increase the generation of power, and then how do I, how do I then um, use that that material as substitute material for concrete. And we wow. we have a couple of solutions that we've identified. Oh, you are also thinking about the building's uh, vertical wall can be turned yeah. into so solar as well. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Things that that can generate solar, but can also be the building envelope, which is super um, efficient for us, is something that that we're actually piloting and deploying right now. Yeah. So um, since uh, I mean, your application, Prologis application is uh, the storage and uh, your warehouse, your building, is very close to, to each other. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I'm thinking if you have a very safe battery technology, for example, you might be able to do building integrated storage is that uh, attractive to you, right? So because uh, the safety it becomes sure. uh, no concern anymore. Maybe that maximizes yeah. the efficiency. Uh, you, you know, I never thought about that, Yi, but of course, I mean, if you can have safe, if the building could generate and store its own energy, like I, I've solved for quite a bit of, of, of the demand that we have for, uh, those are the type of innovation that would be that would be very valuable for us. We are looking at a um, number of different technology. Of course, we're looking at hydrogen because you would have to when you have such amount of transportation that you're trying to decarbonize. But again, there's no commercially viable solution that doesn't take up half the, the space of a truck, right? Like the, the spacing of whether it's batteries or hydrogen or whatever is super important in terms of maximizing the, safe, the, the space of a truck. Um, we're looking at nuclear SMR technology just because we have data centers, the, the energy needs are so, so critical. So we're looking at all kinds of innovation where you can optimize energy really is the best way I can put it. Wow. That's, I think that's very impressive. You, uh, Prologis is already a, a ecosystem. There's a really multiple things. I didn't know you have your data center as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, when you think about it, really, like when you think of real estate, that real estate is valuable when it's powered, when it has resiliency, when it has reliability. I mean, that's what, you know, like I, if you think about the customer need, it is really there. And I think people hadn't before thought about the two together 
but but as the energy becomes more and more um not guaranteed i guess is a way i would i would i would i would uh think you know i would i would i would say it becomes you really are trying to solve it together and that is also for us a differentiator in the market and that that that's meaningful to us yeah so so susan let's uh, now uh, open this up more um so for uh, warehouse for for logistic company if you look at uh, you know beyond pro rogers um and there will be others uh and, and also a different um well let's say just commercial building in general will yeah. probably go to the level in the future in general right it doesn't need to be a warehouse company and and so on yeah so would you imagine this uh, the solution you develop <laughs> Can how to, how 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 does that uh, translate? Can can that yeah. have all the impact and propagate? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. So really, our ambition is to help um, decarbonize the supply chain. Like you know, that's sort of how we started with. So you know, you you have to then think about the 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 collaboration with the ports, right? Ports need electrification, and and we think about that to say we are very good at 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 buying and developing land. We have land banks. So if we can use some of those land banks to provide solutions to whether it's a port or, or whatever it may be, we would be we would be very focused on that. Um, we in our current um, uh, charging solutions that we've provided, we're providing them to our customer Maersk. You know, they they are they, they want to decarbonize the flow, and they're not always in our facility. So we do do out of platform solutions if it's if it's if it's in the interest of our customers, and if it's if it's in interest in the corridor, I would I would almost call them green corridors. If we can green specific corridors, then you can have an impact on the flow of goods. Um, so that's how we think about them. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll ask a last question. If Jimmy wants to ask, please to chime in or, or, or you know, any time. Um, so th this is a storage uh, X uh, audience right here caring about storage uh, technology. Uh, do you have, uh, I already touched upon a little bit about safety. Do you have a list of uh, idea characteristics for the storage technology? Yeah, your wish list. <laughs> your wish list, yeah, to motivate our researchers yeah. right here right. to further develop. Yeah. So I've got I've got two two current um lists, and then and then Yi, you gave me another idea because I wasn't thinking about a building integrated storage. So I'm going to start with that would be uh, really awesome for us to have. Long duration storage is what a four four hour battery storage. Um, is is really critical for us and and we've got major grid scale projects that we're going to be deploying in 2025 to 2026 so so you know moving that needle forward is going to be very important to us um and then the other thing that i would say is um any technology that's other than lithium iron is super interesting to us because because right now when i look at the um because we are, a, I mean, we do things where when it makes economic sense as well, right? We can't just deploy solutions because we want to. So the cost curve, uh, that's my 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 other um, huge wish list, is how do we bring the cost curve of, of batteries down? And, and for us, manufacturing in the U.S. is also important. So how do we get the, 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 um, the volume of batteries in the local areas where we're in, whether it's you know China for China, Europe for Europe, US for US, is very important to us. So that's my wish list. Well, this is very oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, that's very exciting. Um, so I, I do have a few questions, Susan. Uh, first of all, before I uh, before I forget, it's very exciting uh, the way you're thinking about uh, the energy transformation and real estate writ large, right? Not just yeah. in ter traditional terms, but I just thought a few other ideas. In addition to this integrated storage, Stanford's also looking at uh, passive heating and cooling. In fact, he has a couple of uh, 
uh, innovations in that space with respect to fabric, but we're also looking at it from the standpoint of other things. So that's okay. another thing that you might want to add to the things you're thinking about. This is integrated passive and uh, passive cooling and heating that might be built into your building itself as you that, as you move forward. That would be very interesting because you know one of the things that we struggle with is that we are we are we're a logistics center warehouse, so the the dock doors are always going up and down, and 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 you know so we can't really condition the space for most of them, and we lose a lot of energy. Um, so so having a passive cooling and heating would be of interest. We are, as we're decarbonizing the buildings, we are moving to heat pumps and electrification, right. which adds actually inefficiency, right? Because I consume more, and it sounds counterintuitive, but I know I know you will you will realize this. I actually um, increase my emissions because I need more electricity to heat and cool as I electrify. Yes. So yeah. so I need solutions that are that are that are more efficient, honestly. Yeah. No. Fantastic. Um, I, I'm really excited about what you guys are doing, by the way. This is fantastic to see, and we're really excited about partnering with Prologis on uh, on your journey. Um, thinking about the way you were describing it earlier, are you thinking then of going to 24 by 7 and being completely self-sufficient within your buildings, almost like a, a completely independent, or you could just you know disconnect from the grid as appropriate or necessary and then reconnect? Is that the vision? Yeah, so so, so we haven't thought, we haven't declared that will be twenty four seven. Though I'm starting to really think about it right now. What uh, we have is for all our own operations is powered and renewable. So this is Prologis's operation itself. Um, but but the next one would be twenty four seven renewable. And if we can be just self generation and self management, then that would be, for me, that would be a um, that would be a great accomplishment to manage that. Okay, I see. So when you're going to put in the storage and the generation, renewable generation, um, your vision in, in 2030 is to power uh, the operations that you currently have. Yeah, by which we already have done. So so today okay. we in our, in our own operations, we run on on renewable power. The thing that that I need to do one step further to decarbonize is I need to to um, we need to to um, change over all the fleet that we have to electric and then to provide that's what that's what we're working on. And the constraint for us to get there is just making sure we have enough supply of uh, um, ZEV vehicles so we can switch to that. The, the power infrastructure to do so, we can. Oh, that so that was my next question. I see you sort of, so you, um, so the bottleneck for you is actually the availability of ZEV vehicles, not the power to for these ZEV vehicles. Yeah, because we don't use so many of them. So, so, so there's a, there, you know, if if I if we were using large volumes of ZEV vehicles, then the power will be a constraint. But as prologues, we don't have so many. So so it just for for the for the supply that we have, it's not the power that the constraint is making sure that we get the 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 ZEV vehicle itself, which we're working on. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, that's yeah. a message I have, I have to pass along to some of our our uh, collaborators in the ZEV vehicle space. Is that uh, you yeah. guys are open for business. You guys yeah, are the I bottom think they know. I think they know it, Jimmy, because <laughs> we're probably speaking to the same people, you know, and uh, so that, that's on the way, but please do pass on that message. Okay, fantastic. You know, and I was also really excited to see that part of your strategy is actually to utilize the available real estate and actually provide uh, power and services to the utilities uh, yeah. as, you know, as part of the strategy, which is amazing. Um, when, when you do this, um, do you also consider in markets like uh, like Aircat and stuff where you will provide this to the general market or are you thinking about, you know, how how will, yes. So that's my question. Yeah. Are you going to become an independent service uh, power provider? You know, what what is the vision behind your yeah. thinking about this in front of the meter? So, so today we're working on a 200 megawatt solution in ERCOT itself. I mean, with, with, with Texas relying so much on wind power, there's such a need for storage there. Um, and that's where we, 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 that's exactly where we started first. Um, so in, in Texas with ERCOT, we are, we are providing, um, we're taking on merchant risk really to provide that 
that solution to to the the community and to the and to the grid. In in California, it's going to be more capacity. In Netherlands, it's going to be more capacity. So it really is market by market based on what the opportunity is. And and from de-risking the project standpoint, I really prefer capacity storage. You know, we are we make the capacity available for the for the utility to charge and discharge as they need to. We provide the capital, we make sure that the system is operational, the dispatching is managed by the utility itself, right? Whereas in ERCOT, we're going to have to manage that ourselves. So um, you guys are it, you're the business. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. but we're gonna we're gonna if you look, if you ask me, Jimmy, what's the mix of business that we're going to do, we're gonna focus more on where the utility is doing the dispatching and, and managing of that. We're gonna provide capacity. So I would say you know, 70, 30 in terms of how that mix will be is sort of what we're aiming for. Okay, fantastic. This is, a, yeah, it's amazingly exciting what you guys are undertaking here. And the scale, the scale of this is really, uh, really amazing. I mean, when uh, when I looked at the amount of storage in your slide yeah. that you were going to be deploying, that's huge. <laughs> Those are really it's, big numbers. Yes, uh, I know, and, I know. I was kind of curious when you were saying 2.5 gigawatts uh, in the U.S. and 2.5 in Europe. Are you think is a time frame 2030 or earlier or what? What kind it's of time 20, frame? It's 2030. It's 2030. So what we've done is, um, so there are some projects that are 100 megawatt or 200 megawatt utility scale storage that's in our pipeline. So that's adding. You know, you have you have four or five of those projects. They become pretty large. Um, what we've also done is, for example, cluster 15 interconnections is just opening, right? So we kind of anticipate our need and we're filing for those now. So we're getting our access to power um, solved for first. And that gives us a good view to what the opportunities are. Um, before we were operating a different way, we said, okay, what's your need utility? Okay, here's our, our land. Now let's go solve for the power. Uh, that that's not that's not the the, the, the most efficient way of solving. Yeah. That's a long haul, yeah. So uh, we pivoted. <laughs> we pivoted and said, no, we can't do that. So let's figure out where we've got the capacity, and then let's put the solutions. And we transparently discussed this with utilities. You know, they have such a such an incredible need for storage. They're yeah. very um, open to having these partnership discussions. And and another thing that we did, Jimmy, that was sort of a um, what a business innovation is, you know, utilities kind of look at who the customers are, right? Like, like certain customers will, will show up on their list as huge power consumers. But in our facilities, as the meters were owned by the different customers, they don't know that it, it's in a prologious facility. They don't know the, the consumption right. that's happening. As we are putting the meter in our name, so the aggregation, they're like, okay, here is a pretty large customer right? That's changing the discussions. Right. Now they're like, oh, prologist. Oh, big, big consumer. Big consumer, <laughs> yeah. Lots of discussion. Yeah. Yeah. That makes and sense. sometimes sitting next to substations or have land that we're willing to, to work with the utility to solve for the pro power problem. You know, we were, at, um, we were having a discussion with National Grid in, in the UK, data centers, no power, right? In, in like, especially in West of London, no power. So we're saying, can we can you know? Is there any way we can solve for this together, right? Using using land that we have. Um, so those are the discussions that we're having. Oh, absolutely! I think it must be very exciting for the utilities to consider having a partner in Prologis, uh, especially if they have bottlenecks in their grid. Now yeah. all of a sudden yeah. they have a partner that could help them resolve these bottlenecks by putting in storage as needed and having yeah. that uh, access to that. Oh, yeah. this is that, amazing. That so uh, pivoting a little bit, um, I know that in the case of plug power, uh, and they, you know, they supply a lot of the forklifts and stuff uh, for many of the warehouses, and they're yeah. primarily based on hydrogen as a fuel. And then, yeah. so what is your thinking regarding uh, alternative besides just batteries in terms of storage? How are you thinking about this? Um, for sure, hydrogen is something that we're evaluating, and we keep in touch with a number of start a number of companies that are commercializing it. We have not come across one, um, Jimmy, that we say, okay, this is the solution that we're going to go with. 
um, you know, when you think about fleet electrification, we're going to need a lot of it. However, we are we are doing something that that is in in anticipation of that. So. Um, when we think about our charging infrastructure, we do three things. We do workplace charging. That's just for past, you know, people that drive into our, our, our um, uh, centers and they need to charge their, their vehicle. So that's one. We will just provide that as part of our, as our net zero standards as we move into our buildings. The second one is depot charging. So when companies, uh, customers are in a facility, they're unloading and loading. They need the charging. They ask for it we make um, level two chargers or, or higher available in our premises. The third thing that we're doing, we're starting to think about is um, just like hubs. So charging infrastructure that are hubs that are fuel renewable fuel agnostic. It could be battery, it could be hydrogen, it could be any other technology. Where should they be located? Who should be our partner? Um, so we're having those discussions with the likes of, of DHL, FedEx, you know, Amazon, those people, those companies that really need to get ahead of, of having that infrastructure. So that's the that's the evolution. Again, it's not a simple thing to solve for, right? Because you need to have utilization to make economic sense. Um, right. and, 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 and the companies that need these um, need to do that sometimes don't have fleet or they have the fleet, but they haven't thought about the 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 um, the, the infrastructure that's needed. So you kind of have to bring this ecosystem together. Right. That's where I think you all can do a great um, service to to everyone. Because because what I saw, um, Jimmy and Yi, you know, in your in the in the Energy Week, is a lot of representation of this ecosystem is there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's exactly right. And uh, a part of what we see is. Uh, our contribution to this is bringing the is convening the various stakeholders together to have dialogue and also exchange information. And yeah. uh, you know, a lot of times it's they find that they're, they're they don't necessarily disagree. They just don't have the latest information. And uh, it's yeah. it's fantastic to see that light bulb go off. And then once I think, oh, well, actually, if that's the case, we can do this and and so on. So it's it's yeah. great to see. Yeah. Um, we do have a question from the audience. So I'm going to throw this out to you, Susan. Um, so there's a little bit about technology. So uh, from a long duration energy standpoint, uh, greater than one day to five days, uh, what are the ideal technologies that you are seeing both from a technical, economic and reliability and efficiency standpoint? So we, so we, 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 we No, go ahead. Okay. Um, so we, first of all, you know, I've got people smarter than I am on the technology in my in my team that I think you got, you you have met. Um, but we are reviewing a technology today that's called the Blade technology with one of the largest producers, um, the second largest producer of battery, um, which is which which. So when you think about battery and when you think about installing that battery, safety is a, is a huge concern for us. Because we have to to we have to bolt these batteries to to specific um, specific specific sites, and there's a technology where um, the safety of it is is maximized by having something called the blade technology. I don't know if you all have heard of it or not. We're evaluating that. Um, more than that, I know my technical team is looking at, at at specific things, which I necessarily am not the expert to speak to, um, but it's really the the how can you operate the battery for longer duration without having the degradation that you see is what the my my team is focused on. Okay. Fantastic. And I, I, I really appreciate you uh participating in this. I know you're you're concerned and rushing off to the airport. You're looking and just like, oh my God, you know, I, I have to go to the airport. And so Susan, I want to uh, thank you on behalf of uh Storage X and Stanford University, and we look forward to working with Prologis and yourself as you as you continue your journey and we continue ours. So uh, I would like to thank you, and on behalf of us and Yi, do you have any final words for Susan? But well, just thank you, Susan. This is fantastic. Look forward to seeing you again uh, on campus. Thank you, thank you both for for having me. And you know what? I'm always looking to Stanford for innovation. So if you can if you can help me solve my my battery co uh, battery cost curve, 
and uh, integrated storage, then then it will be it will be super valuable. Thank you again for having me. Yeah. So Susan, I do have on my calendar the uh, the little biking tour yes. that we talked yes. about. So we'll bike over, take a look at at the central energy facility. We'll take a look at all this other stuff, and so. It's on my list, Susan. Just let me know when you're going to be visiting. Will do, Jimmy. And, and it's great to meet you, Lincoln. And and um, and I'll um, look forward to meeting you in person. Bye. Fantastic. Bye, Susan. Thank you. Bye, Susan. Okay. Fantastic. So we're going now to our second speaker, and like to do a brief introduction to Lincoln. So Lincoln is uh, Stanford's Stanford's own executive director of energy operations, sustainability, and energy management. Lincoln has been executive in the global energy industry for nearly 30 years and uh, leads a lot of our, our, meaning Stanford University's mission critical operations, uh, leading us in our world, leading us in our innovation and sustainability. Um, he's also a mentor and board member for technology startups in North America, Europe, and India. And uh, he, in fact, he has his own podcast, Climate Changes Everything. So with that, Lincoln, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much, and it is an honor to be here. So uh, what I'd like to talk about today is decarbonization at Stanford. We have come a long way, as I'll show you, but we also have a long way to go. And energy storage has tremendous roles to play in that. And I say roles in the plural on purpose. Um, but as you'll see from this, we're like Susan, we're still uh, at a stage where we have many more questions than answers. We're trying to define the problem. Uh, as we look to solve it. So let me walk you through that, um, give you a picture and invite you to join us in that, in that exploration. So my goal is to give you that perspective from an operational and planning perspective, as opposed to say a scientific or, or technical perspective. I think it's very, very important to frame the problem uh, so that we can answer it appropriately. And uh, this is, as you'll see, kind of the mother of all problems uh, from an energy perspective. So quick structure. Uh, I want to give you a quick sense of background on me and so you know where I'm coming from, the Stanford context, what our drivers are, and then what our energy system looks like today and possibly tomorrow with a particular emphasis on energy storage. Uh, yeah, just a quick background on me. I've been very, very fortunate to be up and down the value chain in the energy business globally uh, for almost the last 30 years. And uh, I think it, it brings a unique perspective to the challenges that we face now. I've seen the uh, world of power go from a fossil, a default to fossil to a default to renewables. And with that, the change in the way the systems are operated, the way the utilities are run, and frankly, the way the customers interact with energy. Uh, I bring that experience to what I call the coolest job in the world. Um, as, as Jimmy described, I'm in charge of all sorts of mission essential utilities and infrastructure, sustainability and resilience, and a few other things across the Stanford ecosystem. And it's very important uh, when the outside world thinks of Stanford, they think of Stanford in the singular. Those of us on the inside think of it in the plural. Uh, Stanford is a whole lot of different things, and I'm very lucky to be able to operate and plan and interact across that whole ecosystem. And we do that, too, across time and expertise. We are looking, we are doing 24-7 operations, 8760 a year, but also multi-decade planning and investment to position Stanford to succeed in the future. And we do that in this incredible ecosystem, I would say world best, world-class ecosystem of staff and faculty, students, um, the various schools, including the new Door School of Sustainability, and then this incredible alumni and, and Silicon Valley ecosystem that we work in. So here's the context. And as I said, Stanford is, is really something we think about in the plural. And thus, whenever we look at a challenge at Stanford, we have to define what is Stanford for the purpose of answering uh, any given question. Here's the Stanford that most people think of, and that's the research university. Uh, world best, I'm a little biased, but I think that's true in, in research, teaching, healthcare, nonstop 
mission essential needs, both when things are going fine and when things are not going fine, and very, very ambitious goals. So this is a situation, if I can paraphrase from Mark Zuckerberg a little bit, um, move fast and create the future. Here's the picture that I see though, and this is what I have to plan for and serve, and that is Stanford as full service city. Um, we are vertically integrated across all sorts of different uh, essential elements. We have a temperate climate, of course, from a weather perspective, but we are exposed to almost every climate risk that you can think of. Um, <clears throat> and this is a, as a full service city, we simply can't stop. Uh, we have to, instead of moving fast, <clears throat> excuse me, and creating the future, we have to move deliberately and not break anything. As we move forward, though, we have to bring those two visions together. We have to make innovation real at, with what we call Stanford as a living lab. And that is bringing together academia, operations, infrastructure. And we do that both for Stanford and for the world. So I'm trying to move pretty fast, create the future, don't break anything, and optimize for Stanford while I'm also providing a template for the rest of the world. And we do that in the context of, uh, and Susan alluded to this too, a fundamentally changing world. Uh, climate change, obviously, endemic, uh, an increased emphasis long overdue in diversity, equity, inclusion, justice. A Generation Z, a younger generation, our students who won't take no or even slow for an answer. And finally, technology transformation like artificial intelligence, like the Zoom that we're now on, uh, a hybrid life that uh, are fundamentally changing the world that we live in and the one thus that we need to plan for and build for. And we do that at Stanford in the context of, of very, very uh, ambitious goals. We are, look, uh, we are uh, targeting zeroing out scopes one and two by 2030. And then the mother of all goals, which we are all feeling our way towards together, zero net greenhouse gas by 2050. So scopes one, two, and three. As was alluded to though, in, in the earlier conversation, I believe that Stanford and my group in particular is perfectly positioned to be the catalyst, to be the pivot for these incredible changes that we need to make from intellectual resources, or resources to research, um, the opportunity spectrum across this full service city and this research university. And finally, being able to be a convener of the larger ecosystem and with as an honest broker, uh, we, we have an alignment of interests that, that few other sorts of institutions have. So let's go a little deeper. What is what we call Stanford Energy System Innovations uh, or SESI? is frankly uh, what most people refer to it as. Um, this is a system, this is our district energy system, vertically integrated, the key word there being system. And I'm gonna touch on each one of these points, each one of these components in more detail, but I want you to think about it as a system because it really is. Back in 2015, we had a big decision to make that led to SESI. We had a cogeneration plant, absolutely standard at the time, uh, considered frankly at, back in the early 2000s even, both the cost effective and the environmentally effective choice for running a campus. Um, natural gas, back up from the grid, moving to SESI where we completely rethought it. Um, chillers, both conventional and heat recovery, uh, chilled water and, and, and hot water it, instead of uh, steam, utility scale solar, and a uh, fundamental dependency on the California grid. And I'll talk through this too. So none of these innovations were magic in and of themselves. Again, it's challenging the assumptions and thinking about those and then bringing them together, synthesizing them into a system that, that in sum does things completely differently. We went from retail power uh, re retail power to wholesale status in the market. We went from fossil to solar. We, instead of exhausting weight to the atmosphere, waste heat to the atmosphere, we are now recovering that heat as fuel. 
We've gone to a much lower temperature product in hot and chilled water. And we've gone from about zero energy storage to both electricity storage and thermal storage. And here's what that looks like. Uh, solar left to right, solar out in, the, out in California, into the grid, into the substation. Some of that power goes to drive the campus as electricity. Others, um, it goes into our thermal energy plant, our central energy facility to create hot and, and chilled water. And then of course we have emergency backup generators plus about 30 miles, 50 kilometers of uh, thermal pipe, both outbound and, and, and return. This is my favorite chart. This is what happened when we switched that new system on. Our carbon footprint went from a boot to a ballet slipper. It fell off a cliff. You see that dark, uh, that dark line uh, heading up into the sky, which is the business as usual case versus what's actually happening. Uh, we've got a long way to go, obviously. I think of it as a long way because it's the last 20% and it's a whole lot of cats and dogs, uh, much smaller applications. We won't get this sort of giant step change again, but um, holy cow, what a step change, what an impact. And it's not just greenhouse gases, it's criteria pollutants, water consumption, um, end user costs, even without a cost of carbon, our service reliability has gone way up. Our thermal distribution losses have gone from something in the 30% to something in the 3%, an order of magnitude. So not just a carbon win, but a win really across the board. That said, all energy is compromised. And I, we need to be very, very frank about the compromise that we've made, compromises that we've made so that we can then try to mitigate them. Uh, a couple to point out here. Um, we have, oh, sorry, um, offsite electricity generation. So we are tied to the California grid. Um, that is the primary one. We've also kept those emergency generators because they're required by code and we need them for, for some measure of business continuity when we lose the grid. So here are those drivers. Um, fundamentally, it's electricity. As uh, I think what Susan said was in just spot on thinking of power first and then everything else. We found that out back in June of last year, exact, almost exactly a year ago, when we had a fire under our primary distribution or transmission feed, and we had a three and a half day outage. Now we had a cup, we had we were able to get some power from our backup feed, but things stopped. Um, almost everything stopped. It was uh, really catastrophic. And the impacts were really across the board. Um, we realized after, and I'll show you, after many years of, of really superb transmission electricity supply reliability, that, that we were actually quite at risk. And so when we look at those risks, it's not just teaching and research, it's healthcare, its dollars, its credibility, its public safety. Um, we are an intensely electrified world and it's not just a nice to have anymore, obviously. It is an absolutely need to have. And it's not just at the transmission level, it's also at the distribution level. We have a, a comprehensive electric distribution system that my team runs across Stanford to keep the lights on and everything else that's powered directly with electricity. And like I said, we were before last year, very, 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 very good. PG&E hats off to them, uh, incredible job of, of keeping um, our transmission running and our power supply at the, at the substation level. Um, since then, still pretty good, but not nearly what we need it to be. Um, and where I, I apologize, I don't have the numbers yet on the, trans, on the distribution side, but again, pretty good on the distribution side, although no distribution system is perfect and thus we have to plan for, for uh, outages there as well. And we have to do that in the context of increasing electrification, increasing intermittency on the grid, increasing renewable penetration. We are just, we are at the end of the beginning in terms of understanding the new relationship and planning for it and building for it and operating for it. Uh, the 
the relationship between electricity and our, and our brave new world. And we do that, of course, in the context of unprecedented resilience risks. Climate change is here, and we have seen most of these um, in just over the past year. We haven't seen an earthquake in the last year, but I knock on wood as I say that, because that's our other resilience risk here at Stanford. But everything else we've seen. Here's where I have a lot of hope, though. And on the one hand, technology innovation, which is those ones and zeros over there, but the also is ambition, ambition and commitment in incredible, incredible ambition and commitment to solve this problem in all of its various forms. So what does the Stanford look, Energy Systems of Innovations look like today, call it 1.0, from a storage perspective? Here's that system again. A uh, couple of components I want to highlight. Upstream, we have some energy storage, some batteries at our um, uh, second solar farm called Slate, which is in Lemoore, California. Uh, we have some batteries behind the meter. We also have the grid itself, of course, which is not just the California ISO, but the entire Western interconnection. On campus, we have thermal storage, um, two chilled water storage tanks, one hot water storage tank at the energy facility. We have the line pack, whatever happens to be in the lines, um, say when the power goes out. And then finally, the fuel in the emergency generators or, or feeding or available for the emergency generators. Can get this, there we go. So outside the campus, obviously the California ISO and in fact, the Western interconnection, um, it is um, an imperfect system but that is uh, a, a huge battery for us. It's a huge battery for everybody. And then, as I said, at our second solar farm, we call it Stanford Solar Generating 2, we have about 200 megawatt hours of behind the meter storage there. Now, it's easy to think of that as a resiliency or reliability asset. It really isn't. That is dispatched by the ISO, the California ISO, because that's the way the system works. So um, it's not a direct reliability or resilience benefit to Stanford, but it does provide revenue that offset our costs. So it's, it gets us part of the way there. But still, overall, a lot of storage, um, if you think about storage broadly, outside of the campus. Inside the campus, we have those thermal tanks. Um, in ordinary operations, the operators do a tremendous job of optimizing energy costs around those, um, that storage capacity. In outages, if we see a heat wave coming, we fill the tanks up, usually the chilled water tanks because it's a heat wave, and we can get a couple of hours, depending on ambient temperatures and everything else, um, out of those tanks. Um, and then we have about 110 diesel-powered emergency generators. Now, those are great. Those We rely on those in emergencies, but whether, uh, whether or not we there's a generator in a building, how big it is, how big the the fuel tank is, how it's wired, how the plugs are loaded. That's not something that my team has control over or much visibility into. So that's a challenge there. We've got to, we're trying to sort that out. But also in outages, theoretically you could re, you could you, you've got kind of infinite storage and the ability to refill those tanks. But if the Bay Area has an earthquake, everybody and their brother is going to be looking for diesel fuel, and so we can't count on that. So what is it? what might it look like tomorrow? And this to me is where it gets really interesting. We have to start with the most fundamental definitions um, of sustainability and resilience. And even in California, I don't think we're quite there yet. I tend to think of it as the first row, but a lot of people think of it as the second row. And until you define the problem, until you define exactly what you're trying to do, you can't do it. You can't solve it. So. The next question is, and this goes right back to June of last year, what are we solving for? Um, traditionally, emergency generation, outage generation was egress, uh, egress and escape path lighting and running fans. Um, what we're finding is that the world's definition and Stanford's definition, I think, of emergency power is now much more about business continuity. Basically, the power might go out, but 
the campus can't be affected by it. The campus can't see it. So instead of emergency generators and perhaps small batteries, we're now talking about much bigger pieces of equipment, microgrids, uh, backup generators, um, large scale storage on campus. Of course, the capital cost goes way up when you do that. And you therefore have to have some very difficult conversations about priorities across your business. Here's the other part, and this comes with my, my bald head and my, my gray beard. Um, in 30 years in the energy business, I've seen the definition of climate virtue go from natural gas cogens to um, where we are now, which is annual energy offset with renewable generation, but we're, we haven't, we're not stopping. Uh, the, those definitions are gonna continue to tighten 24 seven clean energy is going to be an expectation well before we can make it a reality, but we have to get ahead of that. And frankly, given how long it takes to amortize energy assets, um, we've got to be planning for the tip, the 2030 something definitions, as opposed to today's definitions, let alone yesterday's, yesterday's definitions. We owe that to the world. We owe that to the institution. Looked at from another perspective, we're also in a situation where to, today's definition of climate virtue tends to focus on operations and it tends to focus on greenhouse gases. And I happen to think that it's gonna be a very short period of time before the picture looks a lot like this. And again, long-lived assets, how do we plan for tomorrow's definitions of what we need while we're building it today? And finally, looking across the entire value chain, most people would rather have their picture taken next to, a, next to a solar farm than an air handler or an LED light bulb, but we really, we have to look across the whole value chain. That's where the best solutions come from. So what might it look like in the future? Here are the things that I'm worried about. And I say this in the context of Stanford as research university slash full service city slash living labs. We have an extraordinary optimization challenge. So many variables, it makes my head spin, if not my head explode with the, the, the way we need to solve for this. Everything from power quality to grid outages, distribution, recloser operations, we literally need to solve for all of these things across this full service city of Stanford. And because we are vertically integrated, we have to think in terms of most of this functionality wheel when we think about energy storage. We have to think like a utility. We also have to think like a customer. And so our, our, our needs are varied and vast, but so are our options. But again, massive optimization exercise that we've got to go through. So let's go back to that. I, I have a couple of ideas where I want to see what the analysis comes out with, but a couple of ideas for where, what to do with energy storage in the near term. One is at the grid level, somehow firming up the energy supply into campus, making that more resilient, hardening that. Is that a big flow battery at, the, at, at our substations? Maybe but something to do something to make that energy supply coming into campus much more resilient. The other part of it is those emergency generators. How do I decarbonize those while simultaneously providing a much more robust service going from business continuity, from emergency generation, escape path lighting to, to business continuity? How do I do that while simultaneously getting rid of ideally my diesel generators as backup power. So micro and macro there. And when we do that, we're looking at, again, more variables from location to technology, duration, recharge, ramping. Um, we've got all sorts of use cases and all sorts of possibilities. And how do all those things fit together as an optimized system? As we lean into this too, one of those big optimization, one of the things that we need to solve for, of course, is 24 seven. And I'm starting to work with the, the Silicon Valley ecosystem. I think we need to solve this together. 
Um, I think we need to get all the all, all brains on deck, so to speak, to solve this. But uh, that's where, like I said, that's where the world is heading from an expectation standpoint. And that's where we need to head. And of course, there's the duck. Um, we are facing this in the macro and the micro, whether it is uh, the system itself, the California ISO, um, any sort of microgrid we put together, we're facing this. This is the Australian duck, so it quacks with an Australian accent, but the, the, the circumstance is the same. And this to me says grid scale storage, but it also says demand side solutions to flatten that load curve. The other thing that we're seeing is a, a distinction, an increasing distinction between cost and value. And that goes to this very complex, very dynamic system that we're trying to solve for now. Um, when I was a system planner, a resource planner in my utility days, uh, looking back on it, it seemed like checkers. Uh, what we're looking at now is more like chess and probably three-dimensional chess if you're a Star Trek fan. I also am starting to think about it not just in terms of energy storage, but what I think of as capacity storage. And that is stretching, optimizing, and if I can coin a phrase, optionalizing existing infrastructure. How do we do more with what we have now? Infrastructure is notorious for being uh, um, very purpose-built, very short on options. How do we change that? Is that AI for dispatch? Is that expanding our definition of thermal sources and sinks for a thermal system is that granular demand forecasting around individual rooms in a building. And needless to say, we're looking at all of this right now. Um, but uh, there's a lot that I think we need to do in terms of stretching what we have as a, as a prelude to building more. And leaning into those dynamic definitions. We can't forget this that a lot of the things on this list were not even really in, in common words in common usage even a couple of decades ago. And of course, if you're amortizing something over 20, 30 years, um, you've got to think about that now as opposed to worrying about it later. And finally, because I'm coming at it from an operational perspective, it's all about the operational outcomes. It is working backwards, system thinking, starting with the outcome, working backwards to the solution. It's easy to fall in love with the various technologies. It's easy to fall in love with the solutions. But in my world, I've got to start with the outcome that I need and work backwards. The great thing is that gives you all your options. The terrible thing is that gives you all your options uh, that you've got, to, you've got to sort through. Systems thinking. If I could teach, if I could add one course, uh, course to the core curriculum of every high school and or college kid in the world, it would be systems thinking, because that, as you've probably seen from this, is, this is all about thinking in systems and not in components. Another new lens is the Inflation Reduction Act, and I say this because this is uh, the, for the first time available to Stanford as a tax exempt, and we're looking at this very hard, thinking about priorities, thinking about capital planning, and maybe this is the jumpstart that we need to make to cross that cost effectiveness curve or at least get closer to it. But of course, for in my world, operations first, innovation second. That is the mother of all lenses. Stanford must go on. It must go on. We are the beating heart of the university and that heart has to keep beating. We love to innovate, but we have to bring, put operations first. We have to move fast, create the future, and don't break anything. So uh, what's next, or as I like to think of it, what's now? We're in, as you can tell, we're in a due diligence phase. We're in a study phase. We're in a collaboration phase. We're in a dialogue phase uh, with everybody. And this is, we've got to define the problem, and we've got to figure out how to solve it, where are the low-hanging fruit, Maybe it's energy supply. Maybe it's those emergency generators. We'll see what the where the analysis and the conversations takes us. But I, it's, it, we're really uh, looking for every possible great idea um, that comes our way. And those great ideas, 
um, aren't just coming from the usual sources, the usual suspects. We're not just looking at technology, we're looking at behavior change. We're not just looking at how to build stuff and operate it, but we're looking about looking at how to communicate that out into the into our ecosystem uh, so that we can make change management effective. And that requires every specialty under the sun. This is no longer a finance exercise or an engineering exercise. This is everybody, like I said, all brains on deck to solve this problem. And I invite you to join us in that. We're doing some in truly amazing world-changing work. So with that, I would uh, love to take any questions and uh, happy to make the slides available if you'd like. And uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. Fantastic. Lincoln, thank you so much for the uh, overview of uh, the where we are and the challenges ahead and the way that you're thinking about this, which is fantastic. Um, I'm sure, as you know, um, key to this and what makes this job very exciting, uh, but also uh, never boring, uh, is this whole idea of Stanford as a living lab. I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on, so you're relatively uh, new to Stanford being, I think, at couple of years now, right? Two years, yeah. Two years. So now you're just, you're a babe in the woods. You just started to, uh, <laughs> started to become uh, really understanding the Stanford ecosystem. Uh, what are your thoughts about this whole idea of Stanford as a living lab and how can we uh, better, how can we do a better job of, of uh, defining this or utilizing this uh, in order to meet some of these challenges in the journey ahead? I, I think it, um, I, first of all, the living lab concept is one of the things that brought me to Stanford, and I see extraordinary opportunity in that, and that is bringing together that ecosystem, bringing together academia and operations and the whole Stanford world, which is now not just uh, Stanford, not just Silicon Valley, but the, the world itself. Um, I see tremendous potential because we do need so much innovation around in, in so many different areas from technology to behavior to finance, uh, regulatory schemes. And we need to bridge a gap that has not really been bridged effectively in the world before. And that is the gap between um, what energy venture capitalists sometimes call the valley of death, where how do we, how do we prove things out if we're dealing with an energy system where things tend to cost a lot, they tend to be large, um, they tend to um, be serving mission essential needs. How do we thread that needle and, and get the great ideas operationalized, make that innovation real? And we see it with, with the SESI system. Um, right. That was an incredible collaboration along those lines. And what we're trying to do now is make that systematic and intentional at a level that it's never been before. And that's energy and that's water and that's waste and transportation and everything you can imagine. We now have fellowships established uh, for students to be paid to do this work and be mentored and take all sorts of um, you know, specialized change management courses and, and really become the professionals that the world needs not just to invent the things and not just to implement the things, but see that whole picture and make that whole picture happen. Um, so it's just an incredibly exciting opportunity. And we've gotten, with our Living Lab Fellowship, it's the first year, we're actually, it's kind of a pilot year really. And we're already, um, um, we've got a very happy problem of having uh, dozens of applications already for the limited number of spots we have and just tremendous enthusiasm across the institution. So um, really that's, that is, that's one of the places, you know, I talked about research universities being the pivot. That is one of those really sharp pivots that Stanford can be, we can be the, we, we can be the center of, uh, and we are the center of, and we need to make that, like I said, even more systematic, even more intentional going forward. Yeah, it's fan fantastic to to hear you describe it that way. Um, I can speak for myself, but certainly with the launch of the Door School of Sustainability and this whole idea of speed, scale, impact, and scale and impact as uh, 
as vehicles that could really depend on something like Stanford's Illumin Lab. It's great and exciting to, you know, to have you as a partner in this journey uh, from the operations standpoint. And also uh, to see the kinds of um, the kinds of ideas that are now being brought forth and being entertained. Uh, I'm sure it's equal parts terrifying <laughs> and exciting. Uh, uh, especially given some of the examples where you were describing where business as usual was uh, was dramatically impacted. In fact, I think it was one of our meetings where the power went out. And, uh, uh, in the middle of exams, too, that meeting. Yeah. 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 Um, and there was a tremendous amount of uh, consternation about that. Uh, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. So um, I'm not so sure that the audience uh, understands how large a community Stanford is as an example of scale. How, how many people uh, actually are part of the Stanford community in a typical day? Uh, the numbers I've heard are, um, say, 25,000 on a typical day. I don't, okay. um, that's, that's anecdotal, but I think it's, it's within that range. Um, for, the, for the energy geeks out there, we peak at about 55 megawatts. That's our system peak, uh, give or take. Um, so it's a it's a pretty substantial um, uh, uh, city, really. Right. Vertically yeah. integrated city, and even that peak, you know, we're we're just at the beginning of electrification, whether it's the built environment or transportation, and we're really um, just at the beginning, I think, of understanding, you know, as I alluded to this this broader deeper uh, relationship dependence, mutual dependence on, on our energy system to make all that work. Um, this is a, uh, it's in, as you said, incredibly exciting and incredibly um, uh, stress-inducing and terrifying to try to thread that needle. Well, you know, uh, as someone who's hosted a number of visits to the central uh, Stanford Central Energy Facility, uh, I can tell you that that is uh, among the most photographed uh, power plants that I've ever seen. Everybody takes pictures uh, of that. And it's, you know, the comments I hear about how clean and how futuristic looking is. It's very exciting to see. Um, in that same vein, you know, one of the big challenges and with a community or a city up of 25,000 is this whole idea of, um, well, how do you maintain reliability and resilience at the same time that you have to optimize between cost. Um, and I think that really comes to a head when you talk about 24 by seven, yeah. where you're now not just talking about emergency power, but now you're actually talking about functioning power uh, throughout the whole day when your solar goes down. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious on how you're thinking about um, as you think forward, but what ideas do you have on how you would actually achieve something like that? Uh, to me, it's it's um, it's very much a, a bottom up challenge. Uh, I think particularly for Stanford, and given that we have reliability and resilience needs uh, approaching approaching perfect, um, I, I think we're going to start working our way uh, into microgrids over time. I think you know, but but even that requires a prioritization of loads a prioritization of activities and thus a prioritization of money uh, that is, is, is something that's very hard for any institution to go through. Uh, this thing is more important than that thing um, is a very, very difficult conversation to have, especially when we've got so many massively important things going on. It's very difficult to distinguish, but how then do we build microgrid solutions around that um, so that we can, and, and, how do we build renewable GHG free microgrid solutions around that? What sort of, and, and then what sort of resilience are we looking for? Are we looking for a half an hour or an hour? Or are we looking for three and a half, four days? Because we've seen both. And what are we, what are we building for? What's our design threshold for that? But then I think at the, at the, at the, at the grid level as well, um, now you're getting into longer duration larger scale energy storage, compressed air, pumped hydro, um, those sorts of things. And that's got to happen as well. So it's got to be this a bottom up from us and a top down from the grid. Um, and then of course, we talked about energy, about capacity versus energy a little bit. 
um, in Susan's conversation. And there's a real question, I think, in the California ISO, as well as every other power grid in the world. How do you, how do you accurately value the storage? Forget about cost. How do you value the storage and thus compensate pumped hydro or compressed air energy storage? And those big, those big long duration projects, how do you, how do you price that so, such that you have a revenue stream that gets those projects built? Um, that's something that, as opposed to simply socializing intermittency across the system, which is the way most systems do it now. So a lot of very big questions, both in the micro and the macro. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And this is where I think potentially um, harvesting uh, the different ideas or different analyses to get uh, to the heart of a question, to, to the heart of the, to the answer to the heart of that question is key right now. Uh, because in many ways, it's a little bit, I guess, the way I think of it, it's a little bit like insurance, which is when you, um, when you don't have a power outage, right? The, the, you know, it's like an expense. You're just like, oh my God, when do I have to pay this, blah, 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 right? But when you have the power outage, it's like, oh, thank goodness I had that, you know? Yeah. And that pivot is just enormous. And uh, and ability to quantify that or value that is one of, I think one of the big big questions right now. Uh, how do you, you know, and, and, and where does that pivot point and what goes into that? Uh, that value uh, calculation is key, and to justify and or determine re uh, return on investment uh, to that kind of question is one of the big ones that I see um, as an opportunity. Yeah, I, uh, I actually I, I see it as I see it as somewhat reactive in that we're now seeing the events, um, and so I'm 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 hoping that as much as I hate to see the events, I'm hoping that those then solidify that price signal uh, yeah. for for the insurance buy you know so uh <clears throat> so here's a question uh a little bit like what we were asking susan which is so you're in the process um of putting some of these new ideas uh or stanford as a living lab with storage and other things in the place so if you had um if you had a wish list that you could give to the stanford researchers um what would that be as you embark on this journey uh, for them to, you know, to entertain, to work on, and potentially that you would value to uh, to actually try in operations? Um, let me give you a, a, a big audacious one first and then a more practical one. The big audacious one is I look at this optimization problem and I'm not sure that human beings alone can figure this out optimizing a system like this and just reading an article yesterday about turning ai loose on airplane design and what extraordinary results you get right. uh that that humans would never probably never come up with and yet are optimized across variables and dynamic variables that 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 you know we struggle to to keep in our brains so i think there's a real opportunity to think of ai not just as as an operating system but as a design system so that's my big audacious ask. Um, but at the more technology level, to me, the big challenge is, or is twofold. One is how do we reimagine backup power mm. in a way that is without, that doesn't have combustion and is greenhouse gas free and is, or maybe it has combustion, but at least it's greenhouse gas free. And it has a refuelability that gives us confidence over those multi-day outages or God forbid, multi-week outages. The other part of it though, goes back to that definition of virtue. And that is that the life cycle environmental impact and economic justice, social justice, environmental justice impacts of things like solar panels and wind turbines and lithium ion batteries is really terrifying. And I worry that we, if we, if we continue to charge down that road, we are creating externalities in the same way that the nuclear business did back in the 70s, that we're creating problems for future generations to deal with and solve. And I don't think that's fair. So for me, the other big ask is, how can we find solutions that are not just great in operation, but 
check all the right boxes across the life cycle, whether that's rare earths or processing at the front end or recycling on the back end, reuse on the back end, um, or and everything in between. How do we find solutions that, frankly, our grandchildren are not going to be mad at us for? Um, that to me, as we ramp up this this new decarbonized world, uh, we I, I want to be really careful about uh, about uh, you know seeing the whole picture, eyes wide open. Oh, that's a great answer. You know, and and uh, uh, I I I'm sure you were too. Was just amazed at Susan's presentation and the scale of their ambition. And part of me was just imagining that boy, if we could convene a community of people like Susan, yourself, and others to think about or uh, share ideas on how they're embarking on this journey, uh, that that would be amazing. I did notice, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna rib you a little bit, Lincoln. I did notice that Susan's um, or pro Susan's presentation that included Prologis's decarbonization goals of 2030 and 2040 were in fact more even more aggressive than Stanford's <clears throat> out there at 2050. So part of me was just like, okay, Lincoln, you you got the bar now, right? With uh, with Susan and Prologis at 2040, and there might be some learnings that uh, Stanford could or you know exchange with what Prologis is doing to be so ambitious about what they were doing. I just I'll leave the floor open there. Any thoughts on that? Uh, no, it's it's I I you know I um, right now we're working towards the 2050 target. Yeah. But um, my personal view, and hopefully not a career limiting thing to say, <laughs> is that you know we, when you look at the latest IPCC data, uh, when you look at what's going on in our world in terms of the actual impact of the changing climate um, and how quickly and, 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 and how that's happening in step changes rather than on a, on a gentle curve, um, we have to keep looking at those targets. And we have to keep asking ourselves, are we, are we moving fast enough? And you, know, you, you mentioned the door school, absolutely, speed and scale. Um, and I, frankly, I think personally that we need to continue looking at those big uh, end dates. Um, 2030 is not that far off anymore. Right. And 2050 from, in my world, 2050 is not that far off either, let alone 2040. So I think it's, it's incumbent upon all of us not to keep those dates um, unexamined as we go forward. Um, yeah, that's, that's very well put. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly if we were to convene a community of people that it's doing that very aggressively, like people like Susan and yourselves, it might give us uh, ideas or learnings about how these are being implemented or the value propositions that are being used to uh, to validate the return on investment or the value streams that are being created by this, which then allows us to you know more easily understand and uh, rationalize or justify some of the costs associated with this. And, and maybe even as Susan was saying, the potential return that was not anticipated, right? Yeah. Um, well, and I, I, I put my, I put my old finance geek hat on. And I think one thing that may turbocharge that effort is ESG as imperfect as it is ESG. Yeah. If we can get a consensus around the financial implications of carbon and all of these other elements and then we can find a way to monetize those right then all of a sudden the economic the economics change and and uh so i'm i'm counting on on the finance geeks as much as the as the engineers and and the uh and everybody else in the equation um to bring all of these answers together so that we can make it happen Absolutely. And I think uh, Susan's in a unique position uh, of potentially establishing the value of green facilities. And I think it would be fantastic to be able to uh, to now have Susan be part of a community, which is very exciting uh, for me to, to ponder of all the possibilities, is to understand from the marketplace, what is the value of those activities? And she's starting to get uh, I think she's starting to get an idea of what the value is in the marketplace for those kinds of things, which would be fantastic because that's exactly the kind of information that you would be needing as we proceed uh, in decarbonizing Stanford. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, um, so uh, uh, 
we're actually um we actually have extra time but i think um Lincoln, do you have anything to add? Otherwise, I was going to end it here and then we join for the um, the um, the session where we actually had a backstage and have questions. Is there any last minute comments that you have, Lincoln, or anything you want to add? No, I, I just want to thank you for the opportunity and and thank the audience uh, for their attention. And I'm I'm really I'm really serious. You know, it really is. You know, all brains on deck. Uh, all you know, we need everybody's everybody's background, everybody's education, everybody's uh, you know unique way of looking at the world uh, to solve this together. It's got to be a big round table um, with everybody around it, and so um, uh, just to invite everybody to join us in that journey, uh, so that we can get this done. Well, fantastic! I certainly look forward to working with you on practicing Stanford as a living lab on this decarbonization journey. Please follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, we also have our Storage X text talks on uh, the first Tuesday of every month. And we have um, also our continuing education uh, session uh, as seen there on the right with uh, ability to, and opportunity to learn from Stanford faculty and Silicon Valley experts with an online course. Uh, finally, in two weeks, we'll also be having a Storage X symposia, which is it goes to the heart of exactly what Susan was saying, which is around this whole bring up of manufacturing, uh, energy storage manufacturing here in the US. Um, so uh, please join us in two weeks for that. And uh, with that, I'd like to go ahead and conclude this symposia. And for those of you who have signed up for the backstage, we'll begin that at nine o'clock and you have a chance to ask questions to Lincoln uh, and poke a little bit into what Stanford's doing. All right, thank you everyone. and. Uh, have a great Memorial Day weekend. And for our international visitors, thank you uh, for joining us at such a challenging hour for many of you. Thanks again. Bye-bye.